We are the Hollis family serving the Lord in Papua New Guinea. The Lord has blessed the church planting ministry in a great way. 2015, we began a Bible study in the village of Jericho. After seeing some of the women get saved, the Lord allowed us to start meeting on Sundays. Following this, we were able to see the first grass church building built in 2018. The Lord continued to bless, and the believers were of one heart and one mind to purchase land at the bottom of the mountain in 2019. The Lord allowed us to start Friday sports outreaches in 2021, and in 2022, the Steel Church building was completed. The Lord just allowed us to baptize five believers, and it's been such a joy to see many of the young men from the church go with me on Sundays to the outreach at Kapabu. The Lord has also blessed Goroka Baptist Bible College in great ways. We had just completed our accreditation and registration paperwork. We have received our report and are waiting for approval from the government. The Lord has also blessed with us being able to start a printing ministry, printing around 70,000 pages of teacher's guides for CLE Christian schools in Papua New Guinea. The Lord has also continued to bless with the Greek and Hebrew programs as Solomon, our local teacher, continues to teach the young men and women. We now have a new boys dormitory, which is nearing completion and Lord willing will be filled next year. We currently have 50 students and are hoping with the completion of the boys dormitory to see that number grow to 100. We are training young men and women to serve the Lord as pastors, pastors, wives, and Christian school teachers. The Lord is also blessed with the completion of the new mission house, which we're able to move into before coming. We look forward to using it in the ministry at Kuroka Baptist Bible College and the church planning ministry. The third ministry we're involved in is Bible clubs in the public schools. The Lord has opened an incredible door of opportunity as the government requires religious instruction. We have begun what's called 5K in five days. We currently have over 2,000 students in Bible clubs a week, and we are seeking the Lord's blessing to have 5,000 students a week in Bible clubs. We started our first club in Safa Primary School. Following that, we were able to start in Segu High School as a result of one of the young women that was just recently baptized in the church at Case of Sorrow. We then were able to start Bible clubs at Segu Primary, Sioke Primary, Ogo, and our most recent club this year was Meganago. We have gotten permission for next year to start a new Bible club at Sigari. Please pray as the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. From the bottom of our hearts, we want to say thank you so much for your faithful prayers and support. The Lord has used his people to be such a help this year in everything from the new vehicle to the completion of the church building, the completion of the mission house, the start of the new food service for Goroka Baptist Bible College, the continued Bible Club ministry, and many, many other things. Once again, thank you for your partnership in the gospel. Turn me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. And I'm going to look at a few things that the Lord has used to strengthen our hearts in these last few years in Papua New Guinea, and I trust it will be a blessing to you as well. Romans chapter 8. Before I begin to read, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, once again we want to say thank you to you. Thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, to die on the cross at Calvary in our place. Thank you, Lord, that within our hands we hold a copy of your word. There's many people around the world that, due to persecution or because your word's not in their language, Lord, they don't have a copy of it. But thank you, Lord, for the freedoms we still enjoy here in America. I pray, Lord, that your word would speak to us this day. I pray that you would use me for your honor and for your glory. Pray that the things that we hear this day from your word, that we would be able to live them in our lives this week. Lord, we love you and trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we look at Romans chapter 8, we look at verses 1 through 14, we see that to be carnally minded is death, but spiritually minded is life and peace through a relationship with Christ. Verses 15 and 16, we see adoption. Verses 17 through 18, we see present suffering. 19 through 25, we see the creation is subject to the consequences of sin in this world. In verse number 26, we see the Holy Spirit praying for us, praying for our needs, praying for our infirmities. But verse 28, we see a promise from God that all things work together for good. 
want to read verse number 28. It says, We know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Verse number 28 is a promise. It's a promise from God that all things can work together for good. Sometimes it's easy to trust and believe the Word of God. Sometimes it's not as easy. When we're through a trial, through a hardship, it's easy to look back and see how God has been faithful, how God has proved Himself to us. As we're going through a trial, sometimes it's hard to live by faith. Some of you might have remembered from our updates, but the Lord had been blessing the Bible clubs in a great way. We were expanding. We started to have two different clubs meet on the same day. We'd also started the Friday afternoon sports outreach. And due to that, one vehicle wasn't enough. We didn't have a the ability to be in two places at the same time. So we were trying to find a local guy to help us drive. And so there was a young man at the Bible College who had become a teacher in the Christian school we have there at the Bible College. There were about 40 students there in the Christian school, but he was faithful, so I began to teach him to drive. And you've got to remember, it's a huge jump for someone that had never driven a bicycle, never driven a lawnmower to start driving a car. And we had a few scary moments, but he was really doing good. And as he continued to learn, we got him his license, he went down to the police station, he got his driver's license, everything was going good. And so, I started letting him drive just a few times by himself, most of the time he drive with me, everything was going good. So, we had Friday night sports outreach, so he was driving one vehicle, some of the boys, I was driving another vehicle, some of the boys. He left just a few minutes before I did, and we were coming back, and as I was coming down the mouth, I saw our Land Cruiser wedge sideways in the bridge. And as I saw that, my heart just sank. And I got down there. I, at that point, I wasn't very worried about the vehicle. I just wanted to make sure all the guys were okay. And some of them were banged up pretty bad, so I rushed them up to our clinic. But long story short, our Land Cruiser was total. And that's a major problem for us over there, because vehicles are so expensive and very difficult to get. And we didn't know, we didn't know what the Lord was going to do through all that. To us, it was a huge disaster, a huge setback in the ministry. And as I began to fill out paperwork with insurance and all those kind of things and talk with the police and different people, they say, when you fill out the accident report, you've got to, you know, explain to us what happened. And I said, well, I said it was pretty obvious. I said it was our fault. There was no other vehicle involved. I said, you know, there's a new driver. And as he was coming down the hill, he just lost control. And they said, no, 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 no. They said, you can't say something like that. They said, if you want to get insurance money, you've got to say, you know, the brakes fail, or at least it was raining, or, you know, make some kind of story. You can't say it was your fault. And they said, well, I said, we're here. We're missionaries. We're teaching God's word. I said, we're not going to lie. And they said, well, you're not going to get any money then. You do, you do understand that, right? And I said, okay, but I said, we're going to at least be honest. We're going to be truthful, and it's in the Lord's hands. So we figured, we filled all the paperwork out, and continued through the process and no money, no no vehicle, no nothing. And as we continued to pray, the insurance company, we continued to talk with them, try to negotiate things. And then they said, all right, they said, we're going to send you a settlement paper. And they sent us a paper. I, I checked our email. And can you believe it was more than what we paid for the vehicle originally? <laughs> that never happened. That was truly God turning something that was disastrous for good. It was God working in ways that we couldn't imagine, ways that we couldn't explain. God worked in those parts of lives. And believe it or not, I signed that paper with about 30 seconds and sent it back. <laughs> the, the Lord was very good. Now look with me again at verse number 28. It says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. I'm sure each one of us have had circumstances in our lives that didn't turn out as we anticipated, didn't turn out as things we had planned, but God was working behind the scenes in ways we couldn't see, ways we couldn't explain. Genesis chapter 50, you have the very end of Joseph's father has died, but you have Joseph's story with his brothers, and you know for the life of Joseph, things didn't work out as Joseph had planned. He was sold as a young man. Sold as a slave in Egypt, he did the right thing. He worked faithfully there in Potiphar's house as a slave. Then Potiphar's wife tried to get him to sleep with her. Joseph did the right thing. He fled temptation, ran out of the house. Potiphar's wife lied about Joseph, said he committed sin. He was then thrown into prison for a crime he never committed. Then after he was in prison, he interpreted the dream of the butler and the baker. 
And the butler is restored to Pharaoh's house, and Joseph said to him, he said, Would you go to Pharaoh's house? He said, Please remember me. But the Bible says that the butler forgot about Joseph for two years, and he was left in the prison there. Uh, all of these things in Joseph's life turned, Joseph thought for evil, but the Bible says God was with Joseph. God was with him. For us as believers, as Christians, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, God is with us. And as you look at Genesis chapter 50 and verse number 20, the Bible says, But as for you, you, meant it, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. The circumstances, the things in our lives that are out of our control, God wants us to surrender those to Him. God wants us to give those things to Him, that we can live by faith and trust Him to work in ways that we cannot see, in ways that we cannot imagine. All of us know that promise in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. There's two conditions in that verse. One is that God wants us to love Him. The second is we are called according to His purpose. God wants us to put Him first and foremost in our lives. God wants us to love Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. You know, sometimes it's easy to love God. Sometimes when circumstances aren't going the way that we think, the way that we imagine our lives, it's difficult to love God. There is a young man there in Papua New Guinea. A young man, faithful. God was using him in a great way there in Papua New Guinea. Many difficulties in his life growing up. He came from a polygamous family, so his father had multiple wives. He was just one of his father's many, many sons. Very, very difficult situation. He tells stories of being beaten as a boy, cut with machetes. Just terrible things that they go through as children. But the Lord worked in his life. He got saved, came to Bible school. He was faithful there. He was a teacher, was very, very faithful in the Bible clubs, helping us, helping us with sports outreach. But for one day, one day in his life, his name was Max, one day in his life, things went terribly, terribly wrong. And he was doing his best, he thought he was doing the right things, but things turned out very bad for him. You know who that was? That was a fellow driving the car that day there was an accident. <laughs> and he was trying to serve God the best he could. It wasn't, he didn't try to cause the accident, but you know, he just didn't have a lot of experience serving God. And many of the people there said, he will run away. He, they said, he'll never continue to serve God. They said, because in Papua New Guinea, it's a shame culture. It's a culture of respect, and it's a culture of shame. And he said, he's so ashamed because he wrecked a vehicle. They said, he'll run away, and he'll never do anything. But by God's mercy and grace, I kept telling him, I said, you need to love God, and you need to trust God. You need to put God first in your life. And by God's grace and mercy, he's faithful still in the ministry. But why? Because as he went through that trial, it was a trial for us, but a great trial for him. But as he went through that, he chose to love God. When we go through the trials, when we go through hardships, when we go through circumstances in our life, we have to make a conscious decision that we are a Christian, we are a believer, and that we are going to trust God and love him. We need to put God first and foremost in our lives. What's God's plan? What's God's purpose in this world? We see... God's plan and purpose for world evangelism unfolding. We see God's timetable of it. End events coming up. The return of Christ is imminent. We don't know what day Christ will come back. But Christ can come back today. He can come back now. He can come back tomorrow. But we can see in the world around us, the return of Christ is imminent. We know that God's plans and God's purposes are being fulfilled in this world. But God wants us to follow His will and His purposes for our lives. I don't know what God's will is. I don't know what God's purpose is for your life. I know what God has for my life. But you know what God wants you to do. And you need to obey that one step at a time. God doesn't always tell us to do everything all at once. But God wants one step at a time. We yield to Him. And we're obedient to His plan. And to His purposes in our lives. God didn't call me to be a missionary right away. He called me to go to Bible college. After I went to Bible college, He called me to take a short-term mission trip. After I took a short-term mission trip, he told me to go back again. And it was one step at a time. As I obeyed God today, God showed me the next step in my life. God doesn't lay out and give us his entire plan for our entire lives, but what we know, the light he's given us today, we need to obey today. 
The first thing you see this morning is that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are called according to His purposes. What is God's will for your life? Through the hardships, through the trials, are you trusting God? Are you loving God? Are you obeying God's will and God's purposes for your life this day? Look with me at verse 31. Verse 31 says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? You know, as any thing about the people there in Papua New Guinea, there's so many hardships, so many trials they go through, so many difficulties. But if God is for them, who can be against them? The devil is fighting very faithfully, very diligently to keep them under the fear and bondage. The land there for the church was originally dedicated to Satan. When we purchased the land, when we got it, we dedicated it back to God. That very piece of land was known for the witchcraft and for the sorcery. There was a young lady there who got baptized. Her name was Christina. I don't know a lot about her background, but a difficult situation. It appears she had an accident as a young child. Her one hand is crippled. But a very difficult situation. But came to the church very, very quiet. Not very talkative, not very outgoing. But very quiet, faithfully hearing God's word each and every day, listening to God's word. She got saved at the same time as Hercules did at the church opening and went through a lot of difficulties in her life, but she gave those to God. She, was, she trusted Christ as her Savior, went through the discipleship class, baptismal class, and she was able to get baptized right before he left. But someone that, though many difficulties in life, but God was for them, and they were able to live for Christ. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy, he will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Psalm, Psalm chapter 27 and verse number 1. Psalm chapter 27 and verse number 1. The psalmist gives a great verse here. He says in Psalm chapter 27 verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm chapter 46, verse 7 says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. What impossible situation do you have in your life? What situation do you not have the answer to? Whether it's in your family, whether it's in your job, whether it's in your neighborhood. You can't change the circumstances. You can't change the situation. But God is greater God is bigger than those situations, those circumstances, that situation. Give it to the Lord and trust Him with it. God, as His people, He doesn't want us to force our way through life. Sometimes as people, we want to be strong, we want to force our way through life, but we can't conquer all of life's situations. We can't conquer every situation that life throws at us. But through God, through Christ, we can be victorious in His strength. Whatever situation you're facing in your life, God doesn't want you to do it through your strength. He wants you to do it through His strength. You know, as we face that situation with the vehicle, people gave us all kinds of advice. How we could cheat the system, how we could get a replacement vehicle. But God didn't want us to do that. God wanted us to trust Him. God wanted us to let Him be God and work the situation through His strength, for His honor, and for His glory. I remember someone had asked in Sunday school, they asked about how did COVID affect us. And there was many different people with many different opinions what we should do or shouldn't do at that time. But when COVID hit, we had to shut the college down there because of the government requirements. And we were really praying. We didn't want to waste those years, that time. You know, if God is for us, who can be against us? So what did God want us to do during that time? And it was through that we were able to build this steel church building you saw in the pictures here. If we had had normal classes, I wouldn't have had the time to work on the church building. But because of that, I was able to easily work 12-hour days. We were able to work on the church there with the boys. Through that, Hercules, as I shared this morning, got saved. Many of the young men were able to reach with the gospel. And that was something that was a very difficult situation. We were very disappointed. We had to close the Bible school down for that time. But God turned it for good. And because of that, we were able to get the church building built. 
and reach many of those young men with the gospel. Look with me now at verses 35 through 39. So we see that God works all things together for good. We see that if God be for us, who can be against us? But look with me now at verse number 35. It, shall, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or the sword? You know that song we just sang earlier this morning, O oh, the love of my Redeemer. God's great love for us. It wasn't that we loved God, but that He first loved us. That is love. But that same love that God has for us, that same agape love that God has shown to us, God wants us in turn to show towards His name. Remember the two conditions in verse 28? The first one is that we love God. But nothing can separate us from God's love. In that verse it says tribulation, distress, persecution. Remember one of the young ladies, her name was Flora. If you remember in the video, it was through her that we were able to get into Sago High School. It was through her sister Jira. We were able to start the Bible Club at Sapa. But she and her sister got saved and we were doing the Bible study on Saturday. We had talked through the Bible chronologically, 20 Old Testament stories, 20 New Testament stories. And we were finishing the New Testament series, we were talking about end time events, we were talking about what was going to happen in the end and what was going to happen to those that didn't know Christ, and Flora and her sister got saved. And Flora was faithful for a number of months, she was very faithful, even a couple of years there she was very faithful, but she didn't live with her parents, her parents lived down a ways, but I don't know due to what circumstances they couldn't take care of her, so she lived with another family up a ways. But because of that, she had a very, you might say, dysfunctional family. But she continued to want to serve God, love God, but she became very, very ill. And because of that, her family came, got her, and they took her to some other relatives across the village quite a distance away, and she wasn't able to go to church. Well, I found out the reason they took her there was they wanted to take her to the witch doctor. They wanted, because she was sick, they wanted Satan to heal her. And the people there live under the fear of Satan, under the demons, all those things. And some of the things she went through were very terrible. But could any of that separate her from God's love? No. This verse says in verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or the sword? We got a phone call one day, and her family said, well... They said what we were doing didn't work. They didn't tell us they were trying witchcraft and sorcery, but they just said it didn't work. And they, well, yeah, of course, no joke. And they said, would you come and would you try to take her to your clinic, which we are more than happy to do. The veteran missionaries we work with, they have the medical clinic there. And so we were able to get her some medical help. She was back in the area. She was able to go to church again. She went through the discipleship class, and she was just baptized right before we left as well. But all those things she went through could not separate her from the love of Christ. From God's great love for her. Look at me at verse number 37. It says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. All the things that happen to us in life, when they're given to God, we can be more than conquerors through Christ. As I finish here, I want to share one last story of a young man. His name was Samuel. Um, once again, difficult situation. I believe his father died of AIDS. I never met his mother. Sometimes when he'd come, he'd be at the bottom of the mountain. Other times he'd be up at the top of the mountain. Just basically whoever would take him in for the night, he would sleep there in their grass hut. But very difficult situation. But Samuel, probably 11 or 12 years of age. A lot of them don't know their birthdays. They don't know when they were born. But probably about 12 years of age. When I would go, we leave the Bible school about 5 o'clock in the morning get to the church about 5.30. I'll pick up some of the young men. We'll go up to the mountain at 6 o'clock. Then we'll go down the waterside and preach. Then after that, I'll go to Papua and preach. And then we'll come back to the church to start Sunday school about 9.30. But I'll take many of the young men with me. And one of those young men is Samuel. He'd be usually the first one I'd pick up. And it'd be pitch black. And then we're right on the equator. So 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness. So it gets light about 6 o'clock. But Samuel will be running down the mountain. And I asked Samuel one morning, I said, how do you know to wake up at 5.30 and meet me? He says, well, he says, I just listen and I hear the birds singing. I know it's time to wake up and I know you'll be coming. He said, that's, that's how I know. 
But I developed a good relationship with Samuel, and I was talking to Samuel, asking him about salvation, those kind of things, and he said, well, he said, he said, actually, a few weeks ago, he said, we were actually walking back from Hobbiton now. We were walking back. He said, I was ready to get saved. He said, I actually made the decision when I came to church this morning, and he said, I was going to get saved. This was a few weeks ago. He said, but on my way to church, there's one lady in the village that she's also had a very difficult life, but she's very, very mean to people, especially the children. She'll you yeah. do mean things to them. And she said, for whatever reason, he said, for whatever reason, I met her this particular Sunday morning, and she beat me up. And he said, he said, when she beat me up, he said, I just didn't feel like getting saved. He said, I just couldn't, he said, I just couldn't do it. And so he said, he said, he said, I would plan it on becoming a Christian, but he said, I just couldn't. He said, would you please pray that I could get saved? And can you hear his struggle as a young boy? Look at, look at me at verse number 37. It says, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through who? Him that loved us. And we have many difficult situations in our life, many things that we wouldn't have chosen, many things can come up. But... In our lives, when we know Christ, when we love God, we're following His purpose, His plan for our lives, we can be more than conquerors. And so Samuel said, would you pray for me? I said, of course I'll pray for you. I was already praying you get saved, but I'll continue to pray you get saved. And next Sunday, about the same place in the trail, he said to me, Tim, he said, I'm ready to get saved this week. And I was able to share the gospel with him, and he trusted Christ as his Savior. And as we look at this morning, we saw that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called together according to His purposes. Verse 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? The last thing we see is nothing will separate us from God's love. Look at me at verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, yes, Satan is real. Satan is trying to thwart God's plan. Hurt us as God's children, but he's not able because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, none of those are greater than God's love. Verse 39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. As we go through our Christian lives, Rest and trust in God's love for you. God's love never changes. Many times we fail God. Many times we not obey God. But God's love never fails. His mercies are new every morning. What is first in your life? Do you love God first and foremost? Not your job first. Not your house first. Not possessions first. Not... Anything else first, God must be first and foremost in your life. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. God wants us to love him first and foremost. Now the last verse I want to read, and I'll quote Pastor to come. Um, Psalm chapter 86, verse number 11. Psalm chapter 86, verse 11 is my life verse. It says, Teach me thy way, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. As we think about God's working in and out through our lives, we need to ask God to teach us his ways. As he teaches us his ways, we need to make that commitment that we will walk in his truth. As he teaches us his ways, we commit our ways to him. He'll unite our heart to love and to fear his name. Pastor. Thank you so much, Tim. Great message. Great to hear you preach. And the, uh, the opportunity for you is also open to these folks you heard about in the uh, in Papua New Guinea. They come to the Lord through hardships, through difficulties, through trials. And so oftentimes we, we don't look at trials the way we should. Um, oftentimes we look at them as inconveniences. Or we look at them somehow, or you know, so I, I need to overcome that. But in reality, I think, uh, as Jesus points out in the book of uh, Luke chapter 13, he says, uh, trials that we go through, and this is a paraphrase of the passage, uh, to look to see where we're at in God's planning program. Remember the story where, where uh, Jesus says, it, it, those people that were, the, the tower fell, those 17 people that were killed, and the ones that Herod killed, do you think they were worse sinners than anybody else? No. 
Why did that happen? Well, it gets you to think. Uh, again, this is sort of my paraphrase, but if you if you do not repent, you will also likewise perish. In other words, there's no hope for you if you don't turn to him. The hardships in life are to get us to understand that God is in control, to get us to think about eternity, to think about, well, what if that would have happened to me? Where would I be? What would, what would, what would have become of me? Once I close my eyes in death, where will I be? What are the consequences? So Jesus is telling them in, in uh, Luke chapter 13, that when things like that happen, ask yourself, what if that would have been me? Why wasn't it me yeah. that the tower fell on? That wasn't killed by you know some mass murderer like Her uh, 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 Pilate. So that's something to think about. What happens when we die? What happens the uh, when when we, we pass away? The folks in Papua they, they think about that. You know, um, we, we heard some stories today. Uh, about people that are being delivered from Satan. Why, why are they turning from Satan? Because there is no hope in Satan. He's, he's the minister of death. Jesus said, in, in, you know, I'm life. I, I've come to people who might have life and have it abundantly. You know, a complete and total life, not just a better life now, like you hear in some pro, uh, modern day preachers. We were listening to, uh, just very quick on television today, very interesting. The guy was talking about how God gave him financial success because, uh, you know, he was faithful. Well, he doesn't always give financial success. Sometimes he gets poverty. That's right. But what he gives is eternal. And the, 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 the eternal things that we have in Jesus Christ are worth much more Amen. than the things you could ever, ever get on this earth. So if you wanted to know more about Jesus Christ, perhaps the Lord has spoken to you today how you can also know uh, how you can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Talk to me. Talk to Tim. Talk to one of our elders. We would love to sit down and show you from Scripture how you can know for certain that you have everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Him there is hope, in Him there is peace, in Him there is eternal rest, in Him there is eternal joy. You're not going to be able to escape hardship in this life, but Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, that in this world you will have tribulation, yes. but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen. We have victory in Jesus Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So see me after the service, see Tim after the service, if you would like to know more about how you can have and know for sure that you have everlasting life through Jesus Christ. Turn your handbooks to number 502. Let's all stand.